Thanks, mate. Pleasure to be here. Thanks, everyone, for coming to listen to my story. What story do you want me to tell? There's so many. Well, we like, like to start. We like to start, not something short of the crib, because that's a little <laughs> bit biblical, but um, we'll go with early years. Born in Adelaide, went to school in Adelaide, but when I moved back to Adelaide last year, I promised one thing. I would never, A, ask anyone where they went to school, and B, tell anyone, because that's such an Adelaide thing. So I thought, I'm out of that. So I went to uni. It's yes. true. What? No, you can't. Well, no, I will not answer that question. I had assumed it was a rags of riches tale. You were for somewhere on the wrong side <laughs> no, of the tracks. No. Um, Two wells. Went to Snow town? No. <laughs> Grew up over that side of town. Um, went, to the, went to the University of Adelaide. <laughs> what was that? Nothing. <laughs> went to the University of Adelaide, did a chemical engineering degree. I'm from Keith. From Keith? Yeah. It's a good part of the world. Went to school there. <laughs> so I went to the University of Adelaide, did a chemical engineering degree. Didn't have any interest in being a chemical engineer. Like literally, was I think I was 19 or 20 when I finished that degree. Like breaking Bad kind of chemical engineering. I did get some offers from bad people to make things that you shouldn't. <laughs> That's what happens when you do chemical engineering. Um, and when I finished that degree, I was like, right, I just want to do things. So I started started. There's a whole businesses. other interview in that. <laughs> yeah. So I started a nightclub. I ran dance parties. I had a spring water company. I had a t-shirt business. That was in one year of finishing university. Some of which were successful. Some of which were not successful. And I remember it was nice. 1996, and there was this tech thing going on, and I was like, that looks quite interesting, but I regret very much not just jumping on a plane and going to Silicon Valley at that point, because if I had, my life would be very different, but I like my life, so in some ways I'm glad I didn't I do that. I left San Francisco in 1996, <laughs> only because I wanted to go and spend a month in Mexico and think timing, I couldn't think of anything better. Timing wasn't good. So I literally just love finding problems. What was that my umbrella and trying to start businesses to solve them so I spent years involved in my own businesses then one of my businesses a spring water company it was a great little idea it was a spring water bottle shaped like a hip flask and you could put it on your belt which was perfect for dance parties and nightclubs you can do like water right there um, we had a patent over the bottle shape tuck it, it was, into your hip, your hot <laughs> yep, pants put it straight in you could pack more in the fridge it was more efficient but we we had a spring water business and the bottler contaminated our first production run and that undid our contracts with a um, with the supermarket. So then I was a bit burnt out, so then I started working for a furniture manufacturing company, which was a little bit of a pivot from where I'd been. Um, worked there for a few years and got to a general manager and helped sell the furniture manufacturing business, which was an interesting process. Then I went and worked for the Shahin family up at On The Run, um, helped them with all of their technology systems. That was the first time I really got exposed to the power of data. Like we started putting data warehouses in in 2003 and building OLAP cubes and all these things that very few people... That's when I first met you. Yeah, right? so very few people have heard of that. It was, it was an amazing observation of how technology can really transform the efficiency and effectiveness of a business and how that relates to profitability. So I worked there for a few years into 2006 and then I was like, right, I'm 30-ish and I'm playing golf once a week going not sailing now. on a Wednesday. Not, no, not, not that anymore. And I was like, I'm going to go do something. There is fuck all happening in Adelaide, right? And literally there was fuck all happening in Adelaide. So I was like, okay, I'm off to Sydney. So I went to Sydney and I was working as a consultant and I met this crazy Danish guy in 2006. Um, he had this idea. That, just by the way, 2006 was pre-smartphone. There were, there was WAP, right? Nokia had this thing called WAP, but there was no iPhone in 2006. And they had this idea to build a business that would import itinerary data to automate messaging to corporate travelers around the world and enable better risk management and policy compliance communication. So it was like, import itinerary data, build rules. And I'm like, oh, sounds pretty interesting. So I put some money into that business and sort of helped him get it up and running and then started to run the Asian business. And it turned out real, like the smartphone was out the next year and social media started to take off. So this ability to collect data about travellers and use that data to create valuable services that either the traveller themselves valued or the corporate they worked for or the travel agent was really interesting and that gave me exposure to Contigo. Contigo, right. What's what's the origin of the name? Content to go. <clears throat> so yeah that oh, was clever. Clever. <laughs> <laughs> Content to go. So that business was a really, really interesting business, right? Like we were at the forefront of using data in this way and we started to build, it started to get quite a lot of success, but unfortunately, in the formation of that company and then the subsequent capital raising rounds, there were some very bad decisions made um, at the parent company level, which I was a minor shareholder in, but I owned the distribution business in Asia. And as a result of that, that business never really got to achieve what it should have. So in 2012, we decided that we should sell it, and we sold it to uh, Concur, which is a US listed you know, travel and expense platform that got bought by SAP. But through that experience, we left 
like untold amounts of money on the table. Like in my calculation, we probably sold it for a fifth of what we should. So it should have been fuck off money, and it was just okay money, which was great. It was a really good experience, but it taught me a lot about the ethics and structural importance of how you bring shareholders into a business. Right? Literally, because shareholders were fighting with each other, the buyer found that out and then leveraged that to pay us a lot less than we could, and the structure there was all wrong. And you think they would have paid Oh, yeah, no, no, no. I've spoken to them subsequently. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> we could have paid you five times. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, oh, we're very clever. So, that, so yeah. that was a dead giveaway? <laughs> yes. When they told you, oh, yeah, we would have paid much more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, no, they would have paid much more. So it was a really interesting experience in learning about the importance of the structure and how you get things set up and how you structure the organisation. It's not just a product and an idea. When you start to raise capital, bring in external stakeholders, if you don't get... So did you skip on the legals up front, the shareholders agreement and all that sort of thing, so there was a sense of duty with the relationship between the shareholders? Question from the back for Mission Control was, did you skimp on the uh, legals and the shareholders agreements and things like that? Um, I didn't, in my company here, I wasn't privy to the formation agreement documents. I was a, like a participant in that, not the owner of doing that. I personally subscribe to using the best advisors from a legal and accounting perspective quite early to get the structure up and running. Not too early, but yeah, I mean, yes, there was bad advice in the beginning. Right. And look, we had VCs out of the valley who wanted to write big checks and investors saying, no, we don't want to do that. And me and the Danish founder like literally smashing our head against the wall going, you know, this thing could be massive and we couldn't do it because the shareholders didn't want, the Finnish shareholders didn't want us to do it. It was like, like it was so unbelievably frustrating. So we sold that business in 2012 and in 2012, uh, I had my first child. Um, well, I did, my wife did. <laughs> Feels like I had it. Um, and, uh, yeah, subsequently we had another two, um, and I had this very simple problem. Like, I literally forgot to buy a USB cable at the shops twice in a row to plug in the DVD. There was no Netflix, remember that? No Netflix back then. <laughs> so I had to plug the DVD in, and my wife like, you are a moron. You went to the shops twice and you didn't get this cable. I'm trying to breastfeed and watch TV. Ah. I was like, well, it would be very useful if there was an app that sent me a reminder when I was near a store that sold the product I wanted. I was like, well, that sounds quite So sitting up late at night researching, trying to sell this other company at the same time, researching, and it's like, that actually has some legs, that idea. So in 2012, we got a group of people together in Sydney and family and friends around, raised a couple of hundred grand. Didn't spend it on building anything, just built a really fancy pitch deck <laughs> and some mock-ups. And we've, at the time, I thought I was a genius we raised about uh, three. Would that be considered an expensive pitch deck? Very, <laughs> very. Has anyone else <laughs> spent 200 grand on a pitch deck? It was a mock-up as well. Oh, good. It was a mock-up. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, it was 2012, it was not 2019. AWS wasn't quite as established then. It wasn't as easy as it is now. But we thought we were smart because, and this company was called Boodle, we then went and raised three million bucks from the CEO of UBS, James Packer, like this cohort of people that we were like, we are the smartest people in the world. But, but there's a lesson in that. Like if you yes. invest in a pitch deck and the prototypes and the vision and you don't aim small, people have backed those ideas for so, so one of the things that I learn out of that is like, people love bold, big vision. Like bold, bold, big vision. And like our vision for that was we wanted to build a technology platform that brought seamless digital experience to physical retail. So, you know, you could have this seamless digital experience when shopping in a physical retail environment. You, and uh, people like Westfield would give a shit about it. Westfield became an investor subsequent oh. in 2015. They <laughs> <laughs> they became, they became that wasn't, that wasn't <laughs> a plan. That, that wasn't um, a plan. But I think the point you make is a really good one. Is the we were very good storytellers. Like, I, like, <laughs> like, and we spent most of our money with a storytelling agency. Um, but we could tell a very, very good story, and we were very fortunate. We had a really good network, so it was very easy for us to get to these very high-profile people who, you know, hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, half million, million dollar checks for were very small. So we raised. The proverbial rounding error. <laughs> yeah, we raised I think it was three million dollars in our first round. No product, zero product, nothing built. Right? Uh, we gave away. I think it was like eighteen percent. How much equity? Yeah, eighteen percent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was a good valuation. I was like, I am the smartest guy in the world. <laughs> but it, but the in hindsight, that was a bad move. Right? It was a really bad move because. What it did, I was inexperienced, didn't really, like I thought I was experienced because we'd built and sold one already, but that amount of cash enabled us to not understand the true deep nature of the problem we were solving. It enabled us to think about all the things we could do if we solved that problem. And we went really wide. We started thinking about all these things, we employed lots of people, and we started 
building you know, uh, a, a you know, bastardized concept. It wasn't pure. We hadn't really understood the true nature of the problem we were, the problem space we were involved in, but we had lots of capital. So, I mean, we up. so and that then created a situation where we built this organization to, we had to feed. So next year we were like, well, I need a few more million bucks. <laughs> so we went and raised more money to keep feeding this beast. And, you know, we started to get a little bit of traction. How much did you get to in the end? Ten. Ten million dollars. So, you know, that's a lot of money to raise and have no business and product at the end of it. And five <laughs> years, ten million dollars. Yeah, it's heavy. <laughs> is, it, is it now wildly successful and flying? Or no, no, it, we wound it up. We liquidated it last That was a trick question. I knew oh. that. <laughs> <laughs> and if, if anyone's very, any, any good at Google, you'll see on the front page of Google that I was in the press because we liquidated it. Not because we liquidated a company, that's a very normal thing to do, but because James Packer was an investor, then it makes the news that we liquidated a company. So, you know, you don't really want to be in that situation. But, but that's what I, I wanted to I asked yeah. you about this <clears throat> ahead of time in case it made you want to stab me in the neck with that wine glass. But how does it feel to dust $10 million of investor money? Shit ass. Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, I, don't, I don't mean to say that in a trial no, way because so I think it's an important I think question. there's a... There's a ugh, I could talk for hours about this very small part of that story. It, the most likely outcome for the thing we were trying to do was it not to work. So from the very beginning, the most likely outcome for what we were trying to do was that this would not work. Right? Like That was a 90% chance. So it's like from day one, every employee, stakeholder, investor, that was under context that this probably will not work. We are trying to solve a gargantuanly large complex problem, which is out of kilter with the approach that most startups and investors take in Australia. It's far more attuned to what's done in Silicon Valley. The number of times I was told through that whole journey, you need to go to Silicon Valley, you'll get the money in Silicon Valley, you need to go, you know, it's ad nauseum, but we didn't want to move there for family reasons. Um, it feels shit house. Like there's a whole lot of people who I bought into those investment rounds, whether it be friends, family, business associates, the Lowy fam, like the Westfield or Centre Group at the time, but those sorts of corporations. There's a lot of money we bought into that. But I think there's a really important aspect to it. It was the most likely outcome. We did it the right way. We left nothing on the field of endeavour in our pursuit of solving that problem. We didn't optimise the spend, but no entrepreneur optimises the spend every time in hindsight. Like, you can only make the best decisions at the time that you're making them. But you always look back and go, oh my God, there was a much better way to do that. Like, <laughs> that's just natural. So I, like the biggest financial investor in my company, I am now, we're really good friends. So, you know, it's like I did not lose any respect or friends or relationships as a result of losing that money. But we did it the right way. We didn't cut corners. We didn't do the wrong thing. We paid every creditor. We paid everyone out. There was no one who lost money who had supplied us services. There was no employee who didn't get the right thing. Yeah. And this is the thing I think is really important, is there is a right way to not succeed, right? And the right way to not succeed is to leave nothing on the field of endeavor and treat everyone that gets involved in your business, whether it be employee, investor, in the right way. Set expectations correctly, do the right thing. Yes. Oh, thank you. Well, well done. <laughs> I think that not many, not many people are thinking about that in terms of business. Does not leave anyone in the, in the chain alone. Well, for me, it would be a very different outcome if we had not operated the business professionally and then liquidated it. If there were creditors that were owed money, I would not be able to do what I do today. But that would just, it would, I would, I sit on boards and do things that I would not be able to do today if we had behaved like that. And I think, you know, there is a right way to fail. And I think one of the things I think about a lot in my role on the Entrepreneurship Advisory Board is culturally in this country, we do not have the right mindset and respect of entrepreneurship and failure, right? Now, like the most likely outcome of an ambitious idea is failure. You want to encourage that, not you know, undermine that. You know, some entrepreneurs had a really good crack and done it the right way. They are going to be 10 times better the next time they try. They're the first person we should invest in, and that's what they do in the valley. Oh, that guy had a good go at it. It didn't work. Well, let's give him some more money. Well, they're good at that. He, he, she, she's really good at it. They know how hard <laughs> yeah. it is. How... In this country, I think there's this inherent thing in the back of people's heads where they go, if I have a crack at that and it doesn't work, and then you know, I probably won't get a job, and you know, it's going to be hard to raise money again. I and... think it's certainly in the investor heads. Yes. Oh, that guy couldn't do it. We're not going to go back him again. 
I Correct. think that would be the case. Which is wrong. It's absolutely wrong. Because they've learned all the lessons. <laughs> Correct. I get, even now, people say, don't do business with friends. And I've, I've found accepting friends' money a massive benefit in the, in the businesses I've started to work harder than I would if it was just my money. 100%. And, and, you, and you'd feel like you wouldn't sleep at night if you hadn't killed everything you could to get return on their money. So that's just to leave nothing on the field of endeavour, which by the way is a Port Adelaide cultural value. <laughs> um, leave nothing on the field of endeavour. He's endeavor. on the board at Port Adelaide. <laughs> <laughs> leave nothing on the field of endeavour and, and do things the right way. Treat people with respect. I just mean to do Operate it like it. that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Operate. That was just the only free figure I had. <laughs> Operate the right way. And if you do that, like if you do that, good people will stick with you. Right? And I think that's very much, in my experience in Australia, there are lots of growing sophisticated investors that will stick with you if you have a crack. So just quick, who here is a founder? A few. What is, what are the other, most. like, it's most? Good. I think most is good, it's a good story. Do you think it's better um, to um, either have like a vision of something that you're really, really into or attack it from the idea that this is a really saleable like, idea? It sounds like- Dash Milani, vision more important than business. <laughs> Like, it sounds like you guys you, you, you identified a problem and you were like, this is going to be a fantastic business idea. And you've obviously, at the very early stages, got people you know to risk money, and then you've got people to money to kind of cover that money to make sure that you're cool with those guys. <laughs> don't make it, it's not a pyramid scheme. Don't make it sound like that. Don't make it sound like so that. I, I, I need to finish that story because it's important, right? So we raised four rounds of capital. Just erase that we, question from Dash Malani. <laughs> And if, if you think about the problem of like trying to create a, a, a digital experience to connect to a physical retail store, like, and our vision, the best way to articulate our vision is we envisioned that you should be able to ask a digital assistant where to shop physically. So if you wanted to say, where can I buy RM Williams with Afterpay that fit me tomorrow in Sydney, you can't get an answer to that question today. But that's easy to, you can get an answer to that question of where do I buy RM Williams that fit me with Afterpay online, you can get an answer to that question. So there's a profound like, asymmetry in respect of the ex experience for physical retail versus online retail. And it's got a whole lot of inherent problems attached to it from an economic perspective. So if like, Amazon succeeds massively, you lose thousands and thousands of retail jobs. We did the numbers a few years ago. There's like tens of thousands of Australian retail jobs will be lost as a result of Amazon's success. But it's not like if you had a perfect digital experience for physical retail, you would actually have an incredibly good shopping convenient experience. So it's a problem that's worth solving. What we learned though was that, and what I think some of the key mistakes we made on our journey was that we had no appreciation of the level of capital required to create that experience for a consumer. And the consumer experience related to thousands of individual retailers providing us with data to create that experience. So you had this problem, like a marketplace style problem. Um, the consumer experience is crap unless all the retailers act. If retailers don't act. Yes, Sorry. question? Troy said, was it a problem that was too early? Because with IoT, it could be solvable now. So I think I, I, think I was getting to 100%. 100% like, I probably will restart that business in about two or three years. <laughs> I don't know, man. I think it's with the CIA because or something. Nobody can hear we need to get my hand in here. We'll get some cybersecurity the, the stuff. The recording can't hear what you're saying, <laughs> but it can hear me. If... <laughs> I, 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 could, I could touch my ear if that was. So I. Some kind of virtual security system. I think. We're marked. I think, it's, I think it's useful. I think it's useful to. to useful to talk about what we got wrong. So what we got wrong, <laughs> what we got wrong, and I remember this specifically, there are a couple of points in the journey where we assumed the arrival of Amazon would create a pressing need for Australian retailers to do something about attracting more customers into their physical stores. And we bet heavily on that, like really heavily. And we were wrong. And the reason we were wrong is that the retailer's response was actually to build online competitive stores to, to Amazon which I think in hindsight they'll think was wrong, but to educate that many stakeholders to have success in your business was really expensive. So we got to the point where we needed 50 million. We were like, like, we could do this with 50, we can brute force this. And we were fighting against a trend, trend is to go online, so we're fighting against a macro trend. It's very expensive. I, in fact, I remember being 
at a conference with a guy called Joe Schoendorf, who was the founding partner at Axel about three years ago. And he's like, George, this is a very good idea. You do understand you're fighting against a trend. And when you fight a trend, you need lots of capital. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like oh, yeah, yeah, man, I'll sort that out. No problems. I'll get the money. <laughs> And like we did, we, we secured... And a, he didn't offer you any? No, he didn't offer me any. Because he doesn't, he will only bet with a trend. So as a VC, he's like, yeah, yeah. it's very rare that people can A, get the capital and B, execute well enough to fight a trend. So we, we got to the point in 2016, late 2016, where we got an in-principle agreement with a, uh, a um, Abu Dhabi-based investor for 10 million plus 40. So like, that's enough money. We're like, oh, we're the smartest people in the world. Me and a director, we flew over, we drank champagne, and we thought we're done. Term sheet, we're done. Like, woohoo. Expensive and champagne. It was very expensive champagne. And then they just disappeared. So those investors, like, I was like, in my head, oh my God, we're away. I've got my feet, like, we're, we're going. And then that money was, we just couldn't re engage with them. Like, How did you find somebody in Abu Dhabi, of all places? Not Valley, <laughs> Israel, not <laughs> Net Sydney. Network, network. So it just came through a network. They expressed, oil. We'll go straight to the oil. They expressed an interest. And like, I think, you know, I think a couple of things. When it's too good to be true, it's too good to be true. Like that was smelt like it was too good to be true. And in my experience now, when something feels too good to be true, it generally is. And it was, it was terminal to the business because we kept spending on the basis that that was going to happen. And then when that didn't happen, we got to the well. The conclusion the board made was that we had a million and a half more money on offer from investors. But if we took it it wasn't going to solve the problem and it would be unethical to take that money because we knew that we couldn't get where we needed to go and we didn't have line of sight on the next round of money. So at that point, we were like, you have to stop. Right? We've got enough cash in the bank to wind it down and pay, give everybody, it smooth, pay down. everybody. And so we're like, right, that, that's the end of the journey, which is extremely painful. And I think, you know, who here is a founder? Okay. Of those founders who has families? Right, so you know, I think one of the things I got miserably wrong was that I didn't appropriately bring my wife on for the journey. And no matter how well you think you balance life with a startup, your startup is like a child, right? It just consumes your brain space, and it is very hard. Try having one in sports betting where you're at the track all the time and <laughs> trying to say, "I'm working, I'm working, uh, yeah. I am working." You are not my son. Work. So I think that's probably a good summary of the story. But I think so the lessons there, the key lessons were we made big assumptions and bet hard on them, they were wrong. We didn't research them well enough. And the other one is we didn't understand the capital required to deal with the behaviour change. So now when I'm talking to anyone who would listen to me, I love talking, um, is most people underestimate behaviour change required to get a business to succeed. So if someone comes to me with an idea and they're like, oh my God, I'm going to do this and all these consumers are going to do that and they're going to do this, I'm like, yeah, you're dreaming. Yeah, it's it's an interesting point, is because everyone that comes to our business for digital transformation, so the technology is the easy part. Changing everyone's behaviour is the hard, is the hard part. part. Yeah. And change management is the hardest piece. Right. So, you know, if someone comes to me with an idea that's deep technology and then have two customers and they've got, oh, yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> you get two people to buy that. You know, someone says, like, oh, you know, we're going to build this consumer app. I'm like, doubtful. Expensive. <laughs> Expensive. Therefore, doubtful. Mm -hmm. So we were, Just we were talking on Australia initially. We were talking to malls, mall operators in the US and in um, Europe and in Asia, okay. and we had early, early sort of trials running with them. Yeah. And so the the underlying core problem of how does consumers find stores with a digital device relies on data about what's in a store. That data is poorly. So I'm so entrenched in the US. I mean, yeah. Well, look, we, we engaged with a lot of the US mall operators and we got early stage trials running with them, but literally that was the phase within which we decided to shut the business. So when we shut the business, we had 40 grand a month in revenue. We had trials running with like we had 160 shopping centres where our product was helping them. We had really good early stage traction data and we were seeing the signs of that in multiple markets. So one of the things we observed, and I think this is one of the strategic advantages South Australia has in relation to product and engineering capabilities is we'd bring in engineers from overseas on 150,000 and after six months I'd be like, life's shit in Sydney. 150 grand's like a really bad lifestyle. I'm not really enjoying myself anymore. Contrast that to here where $150,000 is you know, providing a very good lifestyle. And I think there's a real opportunity in South Australia over the next decade 
to become a place where product slash engineering deep tech businesses really have a strategic advantage. Not sales marketing focused businesses, we've got a strategic disadvantage. But I think there's real advantage there. The bolder and more technologically complex the mission that you're trying, and I always think of a startup as a mission, right? Now look, there's lots of different types of entrepreneurship and businesses, like if you're starting an e-commerce business versus a you know, cafe, all of these people are entrepreneurs. But if you're trying to do real deep innovative entrepreneurship, you're tackling big complex like life whisperers tackling you know using AI to better find you know the right embryos but these problems are complex if you have got like a really inspiring leader like and I think you need two aspects to that you need leaders that have got commercial strategic savvy as well as technology product savvy really intelligent people want to work on those projects <laughs> but no but it's yeah <laughs> but it's a, it's, a, it's a combination of the, the boldness of the mission yeah. and the capability of the leadership to inspire them. And in our experience, the best, the best team members were not being paid the most. They were the ones who were most passionately engaged in what they were learning from the leadership and the mission that you were on. So if we can fast forward a little, mm -hmm. and having dusted 10 mil, mm -hmm. you came home to Adelaide and convinced Stephen to put you on the Entrepreneur Advisory Board. <laughs> Can Correct. you tell us a little bit about how that happened? But beyond so, that, and I don't mean to be trying, but what, are you yeah. do, what else are you doing so, now? You know, that, so, Buddha, we wound that up, decided to finish that at the end of 2017. My wife and I, three young kids, we decided, well, she's from Adelaide too, like, well, time to come home. Everybody moves home. <laughs> Everybody moves home. <laughs> the streets was, are very wide. Lifestyle, lifestyle is so much easier. It took 12 minutes to get here. Um, so we came home in the beginning of last year, March last year, and um, after the election, you know, there was a, an appreciation that we needed to systematically think through entrepreneurship and a strategy for entrepreneurship in South Australia. And there's been a lot of work That's done true. on the Queensland model. So the Queensland model was chief entrepreneur, office of the chief entrepreneur, and they'd seen quite a lot of success. So there was quite a lot of early work done many years ago on, well, if the Liberals get into power, let's have a look at that model. And so after the election, there was a desire to form an entrepreneurship advisory board, appoint a chief entrepreneur and create an office of the chief entrepreneur, whose role it is, is really to work with the community to enable entrepreneurship in South Australia. And the way I look at that is we want more South Australians being more ambitious and successful, and we want interstate and overseas entrepreneurs investing more in South Australia. And we want to integrate that with the future industries that we are involved with. And when I use the word future industries, it's not high tech, it's the industries of the future. Space, defence, obvious, but it's also agriculture, med tech, these other areas that South Australia has natural advantages in. And I've been <coughs> super stoked to have seen a government stop investing 300 million a year each in propping up Mitsubishi or Holden mm. and instead investing that money in the industries that are employing people yeah. and will continue to employ people in the future. Mm. And that's not to say I'm not sorry that those people have lost their jobs, but as a, as a state and our taxes being invested in something that was a flogging a dead horse, to, so to speak. I'm stoked that Stephen Marshall's government has gone all in on future tech. He is a significant believer in the value of entrepreneurship and the role it's going to play in this state being economically more effective. Now, if you go back 40 years, South Australia was 8%. We have, we have not been paid by the Liberal government to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm just, I'm just happy with the current state of Politics affairs. aside, 40 years ago, South Australia was 8% of the country. You know, now we're 4 we have one less seat in parliament. If we, and so on average, we've been growing at half the rate of the country average. So we will shrink into mediocrity and irrelevance on a national scale if you let that continue, which means there's no good jobs for the kids, our kids, etc. So it's an incredibly important problem to solve. You don't, entrepreneurship and startups is one aspect of solving that problem that we're focused on, but there is a genuine belief and leadership around making entrepreneurship work really well in South Australia and fostering an environment or creating an environment where startups can flourish. Now those problems, it's a, as an entrepreneur, it's actually the most interesting problem I've ever looked at. So if you try and solve entrepreneurship in a state, that's a very complex problem. You know, I should boodle. Far harder. <laughs> but therefore it's really interesting. I'm a curious person. It's a really interesting problem to have the privilege of thinking through. So, you know, I probably spent half of my last year or half of my time in the last year thinking about that problem. It's fascinating, right? Like, we've got a lot of strategic advantages, but they've got some significant in sort of old disadvantages that have brewed up over the last 30 years. You know, we need to solve our capital situation. Whilst there's shitloads of money in South Australia, very little of it is mobilised into startups. We need to solve our culture. 
right? So, you know, people would rather write stories about how successful startup entrepreneurs drive Lamborghinis and park them wrong than the fact that one of them has actually created probably the most elite startup of the last three years on a global scale straight out of Adelaide. Like, you know, the narrative is wrong. So we need a culture, we need to change the culture, the capability, and then this and goes... The, and the parking... <laughs> <laughs> parking but we, but we need, but it's it's minor issue versus major issue. It employs 100 people. Um, we need to we need to solve these three problems. If we get the right culture, the right capability, and when I say capability, every entrepreneur needs a team, right? So we need really smart people who want to help entrepreneurs in South Australia. These problems don't solve themselves in a night, in an hour, in a year. They're going to take five years to actually properly get the momentum going. Yeah, yeah sometimes. And what are you doing now? Outside of so the that I was on the RAA board, which is a genuine privilege. It's very interesting. I'm on the Flinders University Councils, and I'm very interested in the governance model of large organisations and how it applies to entrepreneurship and like innovative ideas, transformative innovation. I run an advisory business called 11.2. If anyone here can guess why I would call business 11.2, I will buy them a bottle of wine. Uh, you got, you've, <laughs> Is that the percentage of alcohol in a bottle of no, wine? No, no, it's not. Like you, got, you can come and talk about, if you work out why I call the business 11.2, it's very contextual to South Australia. So we advise entrepreneurs and businesses about how to validate ideas. So our real interest is in how do you go from idea, like literally the first moment you have an idea, through to this idea is worthwhile launching. Like how do you go through that process really rapidly, really efficiently? And for big businesses, that's like not really in their wheelhouse. They're not very good at it. And then next to that, I also have a couple of very early stage startups. One of them sort of using artificial intelligence and well, probably machine learning and natural language processing. Bingo! <laughs> well, Buzzword. Buzzword. You know, to uh, understand how Hansard works. And the other one is we're looking at a space project. That one I like. What? Yes, I like that one. Yeah, it's a cracker. We've got a few more on the back of that. What's 11.2 again? Hmm? What's 11.2? It's an advisory business. No, no, no. What's the, what is the number? Of no, no, there's a bottle of wine there for anyone. Uh, tell me why I would call the business 11.2. It's the amount of people you have to talk to you. What? I'm, I'm looking. No. No, I'll bit? give one hint. It's very related to a large strategy of South Australia. And probably pretty contextual to yesterday, but that's all I'm saying. It's the amount of people you, people you to <laughs> to Average minimum temperature. <laughs> <laughs> all, right, should we, all right, let's get off this. Should we, ask, should, we, should we open this up to some questions? Yeah, let's fire away. I think that it's a really long-term challenge to solve. I think there's an embedded sort of conservatism in South Australia that comes from just an incredibly high quality of life. You see lots of people go to the Silicon Valley and come back here, or you know, Israel, particularly Israel. Oh, we need to be more like Israel. Brilliant. Let's get a whole lot of missiles and point them at South Australia. Uh, let's put everyone in national service and educate them really, really well. You know, so I think people... Speaking of disclaimers, <laughs> can you say one now? In case, in case they... <laughs> <laughs> but I think that... I think that the only way to change from an investor's perspective the culture and from how people view entrepreneurship is the narrative and what people one on one are talking about around the dinner table. So, you know, generally the investor class is oh, what properties have you invested in? How much have you made on this? And it's like what we need is people missing out on investing in interesting startups and the FOMO that comes with that. So, it's like, you know, so you just need to run through the cycle of businesses that emerge, people invest in, they do really well. The entrepreneurial value that was created here was significant. It's actually in a, there are incredible companies on a global scale. There's Detmold, San Remo's, um, you know, there's the Peregrine Corporation, there's Sweat. There are a lot of companies that have done well, but we just don't elevate and celebrate that the way that we should. And I think, I think the culture change is not going to come from political leaders or the media, it comes from a grassroots movement of people starting to have different conversations around the dinner table. So I have a question and I totally mm -hmm. agree with that last comment. Should we be bothering trying to change the broader culture of like a very entrenched old school cultural yes. environment yes. or should we be trying to engender the culture in the entrepreneurs to think like that despite the broader Both. culture? Yeah. Absolutely. Right. So I can't wait until your business turns into a unicorn and all these South Australians, and it will, all these South Australians you could have invested and didn't sit there going, fuck. <laughs> That's what I want. Like, FOMO is the strongest motivator, right? Someone who missed out, suck it. That's it. That's exactly like now, like there's only two things that drive the invest, hope and fear drive investors. They're fearful of losing and they're hopeful of winning. Nothing drives them more than their mate winning when they didn't. So these Unless they can get 11.2% return on their investment and they have it. <laughs> 
Australia. Haven't put two IRR every year. Give me no, no, not even close. Wrong world. <laughs> Uh, but I think the culture, I think the culture one is really important, um, and I think that it does come from a grassroots activity, but it also comes from a different narrative coming from the leadership. And I think there's been for a, decades a narrative of South Australia is not good, like there's not great things happening here. We need handouts from the feds. What we the narrative needs to be actually no, there's a whole lot of really good stuff going on in South Australia, and let's elevate that, shine the light on it, because then more of that will happen. There is distinct problems in the debt financing markets for mature businesses looking for growth. And I think you're seeing an emergence of a whole lot of new models of financing. But th again, that's not a disclaimer. That's not my, my area of expertise. I have far more insight into funding the idea in the first two or three rounds of capital to get new ventures up and running. Um, so I can't. There's, there's actually a new <coughs> venture capital backed debt funding model for scale ups that's just been launched in Sydney. Guy Ruppert, who used to be on Netus, um, has started a business that lends money to startups at circa bank lending rates, um, and they've launched a fifty million dollar fund to do it. So there'll be other there'll be other sources of capital, but I don't, I don't think the banks are going to be there available as a as a channel for aspiring investors in their own business, yeah. unless you've got security and in the house. This is a really good point. It's that you know there are people out there like between us, we would know everything that needs to be known about what's going on. Like, we are a well-connected community. The community needs to talk with each other. The community needs to help each other. And I think culturally, there's this sort of unwritten rule of pay it forward. You know, it's like entrepreneurs, I believe, have an obligation to help each other for no, no benefit. It's like, if you meet an entrepreneur who's got a debt problem, then, and you know that there's this new mob, connect. Well, right? they're, they're in debt. <laughs> No, they, they need debt, well, not a debt that's problem. Right. But you've got to connect people, right? So it's like there's this, like it's incredibly part of the day to day in America in Silicon Valley. It's like pay it forward. It's called pay it Which forward. Which is inherently the values of startup grind is help yes. others before we help yourselves. Yes. Yeah. Give before taking. Yeah. yeah. I connect. Just, I need to make a comment because we, we were in this exact situation when I met with George, and George said to me, Your problem is you don't ask for help, and there's people who can help. We said, what do you need help with? And I said, I need to raise capital. And I don't have any investors that understand my vision, right? And that buy into that vision. And he made the connection, right? So, so Michelle was saying she was asking and... George about the single problem that she could use help with. I'm, I've stopped doing the Secret Service. Uh, but you were saying, you met, you met with George and you were having problems communicating the issues of raising capital with your immediate circle of contacts. No, it's not that. It's just that I didn't have those connections to the people who would resonate with the vision that I had for the right. business, right? So, and he did. So it's all about this pay it forward. There was no, you know, no, no six percent being transferred on referring capital. No, to no not a thing. Or eleven point two. This is the power of the network, right? <laughs> so everyone needs to kind of put their bit in and help yeah. where they can, and if. You have a community that's helpful in that way, then you build so, amazing opportunities. I think there's a really important thing about abundance mindset versus sort of mm. uh, you know fixed capable mindset. So I, I, I thought a lot when I got back to Adelaide, and I noticed that there was a default. I've got an idea. I need some money from government. I was like, oh, well, Jesus Christ, what's going on? What's going on here? Like, cry, that's the last place I'd go for my first money. Like, like that's going to be a pain in the ass to get cash out of government. But that was the like. And there was is. this. There was this culture of like, I've got an idea or an early stage business. I need money from government. I hadn't seen it in any other part of the world that I'd had involvement with. And that's a, that's, that's, a, that's a good point. Not 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 that's the same way here. Like in Israel, like look, most governments step in where there's market failure and do certain things. But there was just like nearly everyone was like, I need some money, I need some money. If you have a finite pot of money that the government has, and that's where capital is coming from, you are not going to get a very collaborative group of people, right? If you like view that there's an abundance of capital, and there like let me tell you, the prize is the entrepreneur. Like I and I remember learning that like the prize is the entrepreneur. The prize is not the capital. Like, if you've got a good idea and you're a good entrepreneur, capital, you're the prize for the capital. There is endless capital. There is endless amounts of money out there to invest in things. It might not feel like that. So there's this abundance mindset. So I have this sort of view that 20 or 30 years across all persuasions of political leadership in the state, we've created this culture of, like, 
constraint of money and the government stepping in and doing things that the private sector should have done for a long time. It's kind of like what you say to your kids. Is you got your, you got your hand out and your feet up. <laughs> like, come on, let's... <laughs> can't, can't make something happen yourself. I do say that to my kids. <laughs> but I think, I think it's really important. You, like, you got so, your hand out and your feet up? Is that, come on, work with me. South Australians, yeah, it's too, it's too easy down here. It's too easy. I want a little question. Who, who here knows of sweat? Right, sweat. The company, the company. sweat. So less than half of the... So, I don't know, I, so just a second. This here is startup grind. Less than half of the people here know what sweat is. Sweat is without doubt one of the single most successful startups started in the last four years. They're the only startup that in I have ever heard of that's world. got to 100 in the world. In the world. That's not, got to 100 not million. Not Australia, not Australia, Australia, the world. 100 million ish <coughs> revenue without one dollar of external capital in four years. They have 20 million users. But if you ask people who care, they don't know who Kayla is. <laughs> So, like, there is this business that is literally globally elite. They are on every metric globally elite. Yet most, and I ask this question at every boardroom lunch, everything I go to, because most people don't know. Despite the fact that they've even been on the front of, you know, film review. But they build a fitness app platform. So Kayla is one of the fitness, you know, people on the platform. Yeah, she's the biggest one, but they have platform time, like created a platform that enables fitness people to put content on it and then distribute it globally. Create a content program, sell it yeah, to 20 million It's enormously people successful. For 10 bucks a month. So I think when I start thinking about culture change and pulling this ecosystem up, I think if in four, three to four years, South Australia had a space agency, which I think is fantastic because it just made so many tech geeky people around the world go, what, there's an Adelaide? What the hell? What the, oh my God, there's a city called Adelaide in Australia. So it made people curious. If we have three unicorns, you know, I hate that word in some ways, but if we had three globally recognised startups that have grown out of South Australia, if three years from now we look back and we've got a space agency and three globally recognised elite startup businesses, then the whole world will be going, what the hell's going on in Adelaide? You know, and I think, I think part of, I think, culture changing is like, we just want people to be curious about what's happening here. Because I think, my hypothesis is, if people come here and have a real proper look, they'll say, wow, this is actually a really cool place to build a business, have a good lifestyle. And going back to the boiling frog thing, the best way to change culture the best way to change culture is get lots of people who think differently in a community. If you get lots of people who think differently in a community, the culture will start to shift. So if I could just recap quickly for the, for the recording, your observance of the Sydney um, VC landscape or investment landscape was that six years ago, Blackbird struggled to raise a fund, but now they've raised two $250 million funds. They've invested in Canva and Zooks and uh, Fleet Space here in South Australia and any number of highly successful startups, and now people have that fear of missing out, so they throw money into and Blackbird VC. And I think to your point, what changed? I think you know, don't underestimate just the importance of Atlassian. Like Atlassian changed so much about everything. And then campaign monitor, Canva, safety culture. Um, it was invoice to get like these culture companies. Amp. These yeah. companies yeah. emerged, and and oh, okay. So you know, success breeds success. I think that that's what we need to focus on here. So when I start thinking about the ecosystem here, it's like if my call to action was it's invoice like, to go. Is that another one? Also that, yeah, invoice to go. But it's like the, Valley, the businesses that are here and that are starting to succeed. We need to wrap our arms around, nurture them, and it's much easier to get five businesses that are doing really well to do really, really, really well than find five new businesses to do really well. And I think if we don't really, as a community, get behind the people who are succeeding, then we won't have the Atlassians. We won't have those, and we won't get that trigger point. Because you know, if some people invest in these businesses and then have capital coming back into their pocket, the most likely person to invest in a startup is an entrepreneur who made money. Excellent. We're over and out. Thank you to our sponsors, Bitcoins, right. Wines and Beers. Thanks, mate. Thanks for having thanks, me. George. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Cheers. Thank you.